of chapter two. All right, so we just finished talking about enzymes and how enzymes are biological catalysts that are going to function in speeding up chemical reactions. So remember how we said in the beginning of this chapter that there's two kind of subdivisions of chemistry. We've got basic chemistry and biochemistry. So now we're gonna get into the biochemistry half. So biochemistry is a study of chemical compositions and reactions of living matter. So essentially we're fusing chemistry and biology together and studying uh, what that looks like. So all chemicals that we have can be classified as inorganic or organic. The easiest way to determine if a substance is inorganic or organic is does the substance have carbon and hydrogen in its molecular formula? And if it does have both those two elements, then we know it's organic. If it does not have both of those elements together, then it's automatically inorganic. So inorganic compounds are going to include water, salts, many acids and bases. A lot of textbooks will define a substance as inorganic as it does not contain carbon, um, and if it's organic, it, it, it contains carbon. I don't like that definition because let's think about carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has carbon in it, but that's not an organic compound. So more specifically, if the substance has carbon and hydrogen, we can comfortably call that substance an organic molecule. Our common organic molecules that make up the human body will include carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Um, lipids we also call our fats. So another way to determine substances as organic and inorganic is like this. If a substance, if an, if an if, a, if substances can be put together and form something that's living, then those substances are organic. So we can put carbohydrates, fat, proteins, and nucleic acids together to make cells and other types of living things. Inorganic substances are those that living substances need to live. We need water, we need oxygen, we need, if we're a plant, carbon dioxide. So although those, although those substances themselves are not living, they are things that living things need to survive. All right, so let's talk about an inorganic compound called water. It's the most abundant inorganic compound and for most living cells, it represents about 60 to 80% of the volume of the living cells. There's some important features to water that we wanna talk about. So first, water has a very high heat capacity. And what we mean by high heat capacity is that we're able to, or water is able to absorb a lot of heat and release a lot of heat with very little temperature change. This is beneficial to cells in our bodies because it prevents sudden changes in temperature. So if you've ever gone to the beach around April, it might be hot outside, but the water's gonna be very cold. Or if you go to the beach around November, although it might be cold outside, the water temperature is not nearly as cold as the outside temperature. Um, and so that benefits us because, once again, we're able to have water absorb heat, release heat with very little temperature change. So when my body gets a fever, even though my fever temperature might be um, a 104, Imagine if the water in our bodies were able to quickly escalate in temperature. Instead of our fever being 104, it could be extremely higher. Um, so that's a huge benefit to living cells and living things is that the water that makes up our composition is able to absorb heat, release heat without increasing the temperature drastically. Another property of water that you want to know is that it has a very high heat of vapor vaporization. So this means that um, in order for water to evaporate, it's going to require large amounts of heat. So this is useful when um, our body is cooling itself down. Water is a polar solvent. So sub because water is polar, and, and remember polar means that there's you know, a slight charge difference. And remember, when we're looking at a molecule of water, a molecule of water is going to share its bonds how? It's going to 
carries bonds covalently, but it's going to be more so a polar covalent bond. So a polar substance will be able to dissolve and disassociate or break apart ionic substances. And so it forms hydration or water levels that are um, around our uh, larger molecules. So think about a protein. Um, if a protein is placed in water, we're able to form sort of a hydration level around protein. Also, because of water's polarity, we're able to use water as a transportation medium. Um, and then, like I said earlier, because water is polar, it's able to disassociate or allow for ions to disassociate and break apart. So think about putting salt in water. Um, we're able to break apart sodium chloride into ions, sodium and chloride, and have it mixed in with water to form a solution. And here we have that same example of sodium chloride and water. Uh, third property of water, I think we're at the fourth property of water, is its reactivity. So it's necessary for hydrolysis and dehydration, dehydration synthesis. And I didn't talk about this when we were talking about chemical reactions, but I do want you all to make note of it because we um, will test on it. So essentially, almost every chemical reaction that occurs in our cells is going to involve breaking apart substances using water and forming substances with the formation of water. So hydrolysis is the term that involves uh, breaking apart a compound and using water in the process of breaking apart that compound. Dehydration synthesis is forming a larger molecule and in the process of forming that larger molecule, you are releasing water. So because Essentially, every reaction that we have within our cells requires water. Water is very reactive. We're either using water to break apart a larger substances, um, hydrolysis, or we're um, forming a large substance and forming water in that process. And then lastly, cushioning. So water is going to be there to cushion our delicate organs from physical trauma. So think about cerebral spinal fluid. So when we get to the nervous system, we'll talk about how that fluid circulates the um, central nervous system organs, and the highest um, component of that fluid is water. Quickly about salt. So salts are inorganic compounds that will, disassoci that will disassociate in uh, water completely. Um, so um, you're gonna separate salts into cations and anions, positive charged molecules, I mean, positively charged atoms and negatively charged atoms. Um, that's not including hydrogen and hydroxide ions, and we'll talk about that because that is So all ions are called electrolytes, and I'm pretty sure you've heard of this term, especially if you're an athlete, if you work out, um, or if you're just, you know, looking at, you know, healthy things, you're gonna always see this term electrolytes. I immediately think of Powerade, or yeah, Powerade, when I think of this, this term. Um, they're called, all ions are called electrolytes because they can conduct electrical currents in a solution. So if you were to put them in a solution, they're going to be able to conduct an electrical current. So ions play specialized, ro specialized roles in body functions and we'll see, especially when we get to muscle contraction, nervous system actions, that common ions like sodium and calcium and potassium are very critical in a lot of those physiological functions or those roles. Um, ionic balance is vital for total balance of the body. And like I said, once we get into those organ systems, we'll talk about that more. So common salts that we find in the body, sodium chloride, um, calcium carbonate, potassium chloride, and so on and so on. They're very common salts in the body. All right, on to acids and bases and pH. So acids and bases are both electrolytes because they are ions that are gonna disassociate in water. So acids are gonna be what we call proton donors, meaning that when they disassociate or break apart in water, they will release hydrogen ions or bare protons in the solution. So we take hydrochloric acid and if we were to put this particular product in water, it's gonna completely break apart into hydrogen and chloride. All right, 
Bases are going to be what we call proton acceptors, meaning that when you put them in a solution, they're going to pick up hydrogen ions in a solution. So we think about um, sodium hydroxide. So when you place that in a particular, when you place that in a water solution and it breaks apart, you've got your sodium, but you're not releasing that positive ion in the water. So when a base dissolves in a solution, it will release a hydroxide ion or a, or a hydroxyl ion, which we call this OH um, ion. So common um, bases that we find in our bodies will be bicarbonate ions and ammonia. And we'll talk about those later. So this gets us into pH. So the pH scale is a measurement of the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. That's the definition of pH. Um, the more hydrogen ions in a solution, the more acidic that solution is. And the more hydroxide ions that we find in a solution, the more of a base that those products are. The, <coughs> excuse me, um, the pH scale is a logarithmic. So each pH unit represents a tenfold difference. So what we mean by that is, for example, if a solution has a pH of five, then it is gonna be 10 times more acidic than a pH solution of six. Does that make sense? So if the, if we're looking at a difference between a pH of five and a pH of seven, then we've got tenfold times tenfold. So that pH of five is gonna be 100 times more acidic than the pH of six. Hope that makes sense. All right, so when we're looking at determining what substances are acids and then what substances are bases in terms of the pH. If a substance, and let's back up, the pH scale is from zero to 14. So if that substance falls between zero and six, and more specifically like 6.9, we're gonna call that an acid. Seven's gonna be neutral, and then eight to 14 will be a base. Um, Pure water has a pH of seven. So pure water is neutral. Our bodies, I mean, our blood pH is fairly neutral. Our blood pH is 7.35 to about 7.45. So it's in that neutral range. The closer a sub, so here we have an example of our pH scale. The closer a substance is to zero, the more acidic it is. So for instance, our black coffee is going to be less acidic then hydrochloric acid. Um, lemon juice is going to be more acidic than HCl as well. And then we've got neutral, so things that fall around the neutral category, we've got our, our, our blood pH. Like I said, it's about 7.35 to 7.45. And then the more basic a substance is, it's gonna have a higher pH, closer to 14. So for instance, household bleach is gonna be less basic then household ammonia or household bleach will be less basic than oven cleaner. Neutralization. So this is going to be when acids and bases are mixed together to neutralize a pH. So dis displacement reactions occur that will form water and salt. And so when you think about a neutralization reaction, think about buffers. And buffers are going to involve um, a weak acid or a weak base being put into a, into a solution, excuse me, to neutralize the pH. Either we're gonna lower the pH or we're gonna increase the pH for whatever reason we're trying to have. So buffers will, res will resist abrupt and large swings in the pH. Um, and depending on the buffer, we can have the buffer increase the pH or we can have the buffer to decrease the pH. Excuse me. In the body, our most common buffer is going to be our bicarbonate ions, and we see that reaction right here. So we take carbonic acid, um, and carbonic acid, when it's formed in the body, is very unstable, and so it, it completely breaks apart. Um, so here is carbonic acid. Because it's so unstable, as soon as we form it, it breaks apart, and we form, and we form as products bicarbonate ion. So bicarbonate is a buffer that's going to balance out our pH because our body pH can't get too high. So if, even if our body pH were to increase 
you know, let's say it's normally 7.4, if our body pH were even to increase to 7.6, that doesn't seem like a lot, but that is that could be just enough of a disruption to cause an imbalance in the body and cause complications. So let's talk about what, what happens with um, disturbances of our pH. So enzymes in the body will work within a very narrow pH range. And that's another reason why our pH of our blood can't go too high or too low because our enzymes won't work. And if our enzymes won't work, remember, like I said in the last video, that um, if we don't have enzymes, our chemical reactions aren't going to be able to occur fast enough for us to be alive and living. So if we have an arterial pH of seven, do our cardio pulmonary resuscitation, um, that outcome is going to be pretty poor. Um, the, in other words, it's going to be a very slim chance that, that person will come out of that. So patients presenting with an arterial pH of less than 6.85 rarely survive. So when you think about it, let's say that person's average pH is 7.4 and their pH declines to a 7. That may not sound like a, a huge difference, but it's really hard for patients to come back from that type of, that low of a pH. If their pH were to drop to 6.85 or lower, those patients rarely survive. And that's because it really does affect the enzyme's capability to work. If enzymes aren't working, that means reactions aren't working. If, and if reactions aren't working, then essentially our cells die. And remember, if cells die, tissues die, organs die, organ systems die, and then we die. See how that all works together? <laughs> all right, so let's get into some of these organic compounds. We talked about in, in, inorganic compounds. Now let's talk about some organic compounds. So remember our organic compounds that we have in our bodies that make up our cells and essentially make up us will be carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So when we're talking about building these organic compounds, we're going to take monomers, which are going to be the building blocks of these compounds and put them together to make a polymer, a larger form of it. Um, we build or we group monomers together through the process of dehydration synthesis. And remember, that's the use of taking, or that's the process of taking smaller substances and putting them together to form larger substances and we make water in the process. And then we break down polymers through the process of hydrolysis, where we're going to use water to break apart a substance. So here we have an example of dehydration synthesis where we've got one monomer here with a hydroxyl group, another monomer here with this positive ion here. And then it's through, like I said, the process of dehydration synthesis that we bind them together. And in that process of binding them together, we release water, we make water. Hydrolysis is going to take this larger substance and we're going to use water. So we're going to put water into the reaction to break apart the, this polymer into separate monomers. All right, so let's talk about some carbohydrates. What is a common term for carbohydrates? Sugars. So when you think about carbohydrates, think of your sugars and your starches. And we have three classifications of carbohydrates. We've got monosaccharides, which are going to involve one single sugar. So a monosaccharide is the smallest monomer of carbohydrates. A disaccharide is going to be putting two sugars together and um, linking them together through a chemical bond. Um, so that would be two monomers coming together. And then a polysaccharide is many uh, sugars being linked together. So polymers are made up of monomers of monosaccharides, linking many monosaccharides together to form polysaccharides. So examples of monosaccharides that I want you to remember We've got glucose, which is a very common monosaccharide because that's what we use, or that's what our blood sugar is mostly composed of. Um, and then we also have ribose and deoxyribose. We find ribose in RNA and deoxyribose in DNA. Like some examples of disaccharides that I want you to remember, we have sucrose, maltose, and lactose. So we're putting two Monosaccharide, monosaccharides together to form disaccharides. And remember, those two monosaccharides are going to be bound together through the process of dehydration synthesis. 
And then polysaccharides are going to be formed from many monosaccharides and some common examples of polysaccharides that I want you to remember will be starch and glycogen. So starch is going to be the carbohydrate storage form used in plants. Glycogen is the carbohydrate storage form used in animals. So we fall in that category and glycogen is the storage molecule for sugar that we find very common in our muscles. Moving on to lipids. So common term for lipids are fats. And remember that, or if you don't know, now you know, lipids do not dissolve in water. So we have four different types of lipids that we'll talk about. We've got triglycerides, phospholipids, steroids, and eicosanoids. So triglycerides are called fats when they are solid and oils when they are liquid. Um, they're composed of three fatty acids and a glycerol molecule. And the main functions of triglycerides are energy storage, insulation, and protection. Um, the most common type of fats that we have in our bodies are triglycerides. And I do want you to remember that. So here is a, uh, what, here's what a triglyceride molecule looks like. We've got our glycerol component and our fatty acid component here. Um, and then here is a more accurate representation of a triglyceride. We've got three, um, three fatty acids, so here's the tri part, and then this is the glycerol molecule. All right, so when you're looking at fats, we can, um, we can categorize our triglycerides into two categories, saturated and unsaturated. So a triglyceride that is saturated, we define that by saying that the bonds between the um, carbon and hydrogen atoms are going to be single covalent bonds. So like we said before, when a triglyceride molecule is at room temperature, um, it can be, it is, it, it will be in a solid form of matter. With saturated fatty acids, because the molecular structure of the triglyceride has only single covalent bonds, we're able to pack those bonds very closely together so that at room temperature, they are always solid. So when you think of saturated fatty acids and we can relate that to food, think about your animal fats and butter. So you think about butter, margarine, and things like that. When they are at room temperature, they are solid. And if you were to look at the um, nutrition label, you would see a concentration of saturated fatty acids. Now, so when you look at this, when we look at the molecular structure and this fatty acid chain here, there's only single covalent bonds, excuse me, linking these molecules together. And so since there's no double bonds, in this chain right here, we're able to pack those molecules together and we form a solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fatty acids are, are termed unsaturated because there's at least one double bond in that fatty acid chain. chain. So this double bond causes a kink in the fatty acid, which prohibits the molecule from packing very closely together. So unsaturated fatty acids are liquid at room temperature. So think about all of your oils, plant oils and olive oil. Trans fats are modified unsaturated fatty acid oils that resemble the structure of saturated fatty, I mean, saturated fats and are considered unhealthy. Um, your omega-3 fatty acids are going to be what we call those heart healthy fatty acids. Um, and those do have double bonds which is why um, they are, they represent more of our oils. So here we have a, an example of what un, an unsaturated fatty acid chain looks like. So here we've got a saturated fatty acid chain because we have no double bonds, but we've got this one double bond here in the fatty acid chain and notices that it forms a kink or a bend in the fatty acid chain. And so because of that, we can't pack this molecule very tight together. So it's gonna be an oil at room temperature. Can you determine between the saturated fatty acids and the unsaturated fatty acids, which ones are healthier for you? If you said unsaturated fatty acids, you are correct. Because when you think about it too, think about it like this. If a saturated, and, and I forgot to tell you all this, so let me tell you all this now, totally forgot. Of the three types of bonds that we have, 
high, hydrogen covalent bonds and ionic bonds. The covalent bonds are the strongest types of bonds that we have, which means they are hardest to break apart. So if we have a single covalent bond, those bonds are really hard to break apart. So when we think about digesting and breaking down substances, it's harder for our bodies to break down food substances that have that are packed with single covalent bonds versus substances that have double bonds in them because they have double bonds, the double bonds makes the structure weaker or more easily to break. So when you're consuming more healthy fats, it's because our body's able to break them down easier and so they're healthier for us so we can actually break the products down, use the nutritional components and get rid of the waste that we don't need. But those saturated fatty acid based foods are not always broken down by our body. So if they're not broken down, we're storing excess fats, those fats can convert to plaques and they can get stored in our arteries and on and on and on and on. All right, enough about that. Phospholipids, this is another category of lipids. They are modified triglycerides and we more so find phospholipids when we're talking about the structures of our cell membrane. The interesting thing about phospholipids is that they have what we call a hydrophilic head. So this area of the phospholipid is what we call our hydrophilic head. And that term hydrophilic means water loving. So the hydrophilic head of a phospholipid does like to interact with water. But the tails here are fatty acids. And like we just learned, lipids do not dissolve in water. So the fatty acid tails are gonna be nonpolar and we call them hydrophobic, which means water fearing. They don't wanna interact with water. So we'll talk more about this in chapter three, but when we're talking about the arrangements of phospholipids to make up the cell membrane, and we'll see it here, the heads are going to face the environment that has water. So we've got hydrophilic heads here and then hydrophilic head, heads here. So the heads will face the watery environments. The tails will turn inward toward each other so that they can get further away from water. Since the tails are hydrophobic, they don't like water because they are lipid based. And we'll talk more about this in chapter three. All right, steroids, they consist of four interlocking ring structures, and the most important type of steroid that we have in the body is cholesterol. So cholesterol has kind of been given a bad name because we hear it and we're like, ooh, I don't need to have high cholesterol because that's going to lead to arth arth arthrosclerosis and, you know, plaque buildup in my arteries. But cholesterol is actually very important in the overall function of our cell membranes, our brain, um, our reproductive structures and hormones and things like that. So we just, we don't need too much of it, but it is very vital to our overall function. So steroids are the starting materials for synthesis of vitamin D, steroid hormones, and bile salts. A lot of our steroid hormones make up our reproductive hormones as well. And steroids are also important in the cell plasma, plasma membrane structures, and we'll see more of that in chapter three. Um, and here we have an example of just what a steroid molecule looks like. Not going to make you memorize the structure of it, but that's just there for your visual purpose. And then lastly, the eicosanoids are derived from a fatty acid found in cell membranes. The most important ones are prostaglandins. So prostaglandins play a role in blood clotting, controlling blood pressure, inflammation, and labor contractions. And um, inflammatory actions are blocked by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as aspirin and ibuprofen. All right, let's move on to protein. So proteins are gonna comprise about 20 to 30% of our cell mass. Proteins are going to be the most abundant organic compound that we find associated with our cells and really in our bodies. Um, they have many functions. So some of the functions of proteins are going to be structural, meaning that they're um, important in making up the structural components of our cells. Chemical, a lot of our enzymes are going to be proteins. Um, and then proteins are also very vital in contractions of muscle. Um, the monomers of proteins will be amino acids. So we tend to say the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. And those amino acids are bound together 
through a peptide bond. The peptide bond is just a specific type of bond that holds amino acids together. In order to make a protein, a protein has to go through four different stages to become a fully functioning protein. Um, figure 2.20 ABC, A, B, and C are just giving us examples of uh, the different roles of proteins. So we have structural proteins called collagen. So that's an example of a structural protein. Here we see enzymes. Um, so this is a protein and we'll talk more about how enzymes work. Um, and then here we have transportation. So in our red blood cells, we have a protein called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is how red blood cells, I mean, how oxygen attaches to our red blood cells and how our red blood cells are able to carry oxygen. Um, we've got protein structures of myosin and actin that are going to be essential in allowing muscle to contract. We need communication proteins that will allow substances to move in and out of the cell membrane. And then a lot of our defense mechanisms um, and our immune system, the defense mechanisms of the immune system are proteins. Like I said, the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. There are 20 that we are aware of, and so the different arrangement of them allows for us to make many different types of proteins. And amino acids are bound together through peptide bonds. So when you look at the structure of an amino acid, which I do want you to know, all amino acids are gonna have the same basic structure, an amino group, a carboxyl group, a hydrogen, a carbon, and then each amino acid is different based on this R group that it has. So that R is just a placement holder that tells us there's going to be a unique chain, um, a unique molecular structure that will define what that amino acid is. All right, so here we have an example of combining amino acids together to make a larger substance. So we have two amino acids here, and then we're gonna form them together through dehydration synthesis to form what we call a dipeptide, two peptide molecules together. Um, all right, so let's talk about how we can build a protein. Like I mentioned earlier, we have to go through four structural changes to build a protein. So we've got the primary level, secondary level, ter ter tertiary level, excuse me, and then the quaternary level. So. The primary structure of a protein is just going to involve linking amino acids together. So we've got one, two, three, four, five amino acids here. If we link them all together and form a linear structure, that's what we, do, that's what we deem with the primary level of a, of a protein. At this level, this protein is not functional. It cannot function at all. We're just simply linking amino acids together. So then once we link them together, we're gonna to start folding the amino acid um, using different types of bonds and we can form the secondary structure. If the folding of the amino acid chain ends up looking more like a helix, then we say that this is the alpha helix or the alpha, it, there's an alpha helix to the secondary structure. If the bonding together of that amino acid chain forms more of a pleated structure, then we say that the secondary structure of a protein has a pleated structure. To make the tertiary structure of a protein, we continue to fold that amino acid chain together and it forms a globular shape. So at this point, um, some proteins are functional at this level and um, they're able to carry out whatever functions that they're supposed to have. Um, so when you see a protein in this globular form, that's how we know we've gotten to this third level. Um, however, a lot of proteins do need to get to the quaternary level of the protein structure to be most functional. And when we're at the quaternary level, we're linking more than one amino acid chain together in this glob to form a fully functioning protein. So here we see two proteins, one protein structure here and another, um, I should say one amino acid structure here and then an, another amino acid structure here. We're linking these two polypeptide chains together to form a fully functioning protein. Um, that term polypeptide chain, so we see that term right here, polypeptide. When you hear polypeptide chain, all we're simply saying is a chain of amino acids. 
polypeptide, there's many peptide bonds holding amino acids together. So sometimes that primary structure of a protein is simply called a polypeptide chain, and they're essentially the same thing. And here's an animation that talks about building a protein together. Definitely think that you should go back and watch it. Alrighty, so we have two types of proteins. We have fibrous and globular. Our fibrous proteins, we also call structural proteins. Um, they are strand-like, they are not able to dissolve in water, and they tend to be very stable. And that name makes sense. If you think about structural proteins, I know when I think of structural, I think of a framework. So you would want these proteins to be very stable. Um, most have either that third level or fourth level protein structure. And they provide mechanical support and tensile strength. So examples of fibrous proteins or structural proteins are keratin, elastin, and collagen. Globular proteins tend to be our functional proteins. So they're more compact, they're spherical, they do dissolve in water, and they're very sensitive to environmental changes. Um, globular Proteins are going to have that third level or that fourth level structure, and they're going to have specific functional regions that will allow for them to be active. So they're going to have actual active sites that um, substances can bind into so that they're able to carry out a particular action. So examples of functional proteins are going to be our antibodies, our hormones, molecular chaperones, and enzymes. So protein denatur denaturation. If a globular protein is put into certain conditions, it will unfold and what we call denature. And in other words, it will lose its 3D shape. So it will lose that quaternary or that third level shape and denature or unfold to either the secondary or primary level of a protein. Um, some Environments that can cause a protein to denature will be a decrease in a pH. So let's say your blood pH decreases. Remember like we were talking about in the homeostatic imbalance, if the blood pH were to decrease too much, it, it will inactivate enzymes. And what's happening, enzymes are proteins, it will cause that um, protein, that enzyme, to denature and unfold from its quaternary structure or its third level structure to a secondary or first level structure. If a protein, especially if a globular protein were to denature, the active sites become deactivated and there's no way that a substance can bind to it and then allow for it to work. Also, increased temperature can cause proteins to denature. So your book gives you an example of um, cooking an egg. So if you take an egg, crack it open, and then you put that egg in a hot frying pan, notice how um, the egg white turns actually white instead of being clear. Um, that white color change is the denaturation of the proteins in the egg white. Um, and when you denature a protein, if the conditions of denaturation are very extreme, you cannot undo it. So think about, you know, if you cook an egg, you can't uncook the egg and then make the egg white clear and very thick. Like, you know, once you put that, once that egg hits that frying pan, it denatures that egg white, and the egg white goes from being clear to very white, and even the texture is different. So let's talk about enzymes and enzymes activity. So like we just learned, enzymes are globular proteins that act as biological catalysts. And remember, a catalyst is gonna speed up an achemical reaction. So the, um, the lower the energy needed to initiate a chemical reaction, the faster we can make those products. And so that's where enzymes help us. So if you look at a enzyme, let me get my picture here. Let's, let's, let's go here because I think it'll be easier to talk about it here. So we've got our protein or enzyme here. Notice that there are two active sites. So the way the enzymes work is that they are going to attract substrates. Substrates are going to be the substances that can fit in, a, in the active sites of an enzyme. So substrates are attracted to these active sites and when we bring these substrates together, because now they're in the same space, these substrates can react together and we can form a chemical bond between the two substrates. Of course, we're using that process of dehydration synthesis because we're releasing water. And when we form that bond between these two substrates, 
that product now that we form is released from the enzyme and the enzyme is ready and available to initiate another reaction. So the reason why enzymes help to speed up chemical reactions is if there was not an enzyme present, we would have to wait for these substrates to just randomly find each other and then allow for a chemical reaction to occur. Um, and that could take however long way too long for life to be sustained. But when enzymes are present in a chemical reaction, the enzymes have an attractive, um, it's an attractive feature almost, that will attract the substrates to the enzymes. And so now we're attracting them faster together. We can form the, bond, the uh, bonds be better or faster, I should say, between the two substrates. And then we can release the, the newly formed product and this enzyme can work again to form other products. Remember that enzymes do not alter the product. So, you know, when the enzymes bind, I mean, when the substrate is binding to the um, enzyme, the enzyme doesn't change the substrate. It's literally just bringing the substrates together so that we can form a chemical bond. Also notice that the enzyme itself is not used up. It's simply there to speed up the chemical reaction. Um, here we see how enzymes also speed up a chemical reaction. So we've got these reactants here, and if there's no enzyme in the uh, reaction, it takes all of this energy, which we call the activation energy, to initiate the reaction to then form the product. Versus if an enzyme is present in a reaction, it takes only this amount of energy to start the chemical reaction and then we form our products faster. So when you think about the activation energy, think about starting a car, because um, that's how I think about it. So I've got this old car, you know, it's made in the 80s. Um, it's just old, you know, it's the person who has it tried to keep it up. But, you know, it's just old. So when you go to start the car, it's probably going to be, you know, revving and it's going to take a lot of energy to get that car up and running compared to a new car that's got a fresh battery and all the parts are new. I mean, as soon as you start that car, it immediately starts up. It doesn't take a lot of energy to, to start the car. And I think about that when I think about a reaction that has no enzymes compared to a reaction that has enzymes. It takes much less energy to start the chemical reaction with enzymes, which means I can make my products faster. All right. Lastly, nucleic acids. So nucleic acids are going to be those, um, that organic compound that's going to determine the function of the cell. So a nucleic acid is going to be a polymer that is made up of monomers called nucleotides. We have two major classes of nucleic acids, deoxyribonucleic acid, which we know as DNA, and then ribonucleic acid, which we know as RNA. So DNA holds the blueprint for the synthesis of all proteins and essentially is going to provide the identity of that cell. So DNA is double-stranded. Most of us are aware of this. Um, and DNA is going to be located in the nucleus of the cell. The nucleotides that make up DNA are going to be a, that are, I'm sorry, the nucleotides will contain a sugar that we call deoxyribose. It will contain a phosphate group and it will contain one of four nitrogenous bases. So we have four nitrogenous bases that are associated only with DNA. We have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. The nitrogenous bases are going to pair with each other, and we call it um, the, comp the complementary base pairing rule, where adenine will always bind with thymine, and then guanine always binds with cytosine. So if you look at this molecule of DNA here, you'll notice that we have the adenine binding with thymine, cytosine binding with guanine, We've got our double-stranded DNA helical um, structure as well. And um, the backbone of DNA, so the purple um, ribbon-like structures, essentially are going to contain the phosphate group and the, nitro and the, and the sugar, deoxyribose. The latter, or I should say the steps, of this ladder-like structure 
would be the nitrogenous base. So some people equate the structure of a DNA to a ladder. So the um, backbone of the ladder would be phosphate and deoxyribose. And then the rungs of the ladder or the steps of the ladder would be the nitrogenous bases. RNA is similar to DNA, um, but RNA is much different than DNA. Our RNA is, is specifically going to be the intermediate step in protein synthesis. Structurally, it is slightly different as well. So when you look at DNA, DNA is a double helix structure. RNA is single-stranded. Um, another difference between DNA and RNA is that DNA has a sugar called deoxyribose and RNA has a sugar called ribose. Third, another difference is that when we're looking at the nitrogenous bases associated with DNA and RNA, um, RNA does not have thymine, RNA has uracil. So DNA has adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. RNA has adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil. So in RNA, adenine is going to bind with uracil. In DNA, adenine will bind with thymine. So if you're looking at a molecule under a microscope, the fastest way to tell if you're looking at DNA or RNA is do I see thymine or do I see uracil? And if you say, you know, thymine, then I know this is DNA. If I see uracil, I know that this is RNA unless there's a mutation there. And then lastly, we have three different types of RNA um, when we're looking at protein synthesis. And we'll look more into this when we get to chapter three. We have messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. And we won't spend too much time, like I said, we're not going to delve deep into it now um, because we do that in chapter three. All right, so let's lastly talk about ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and it is the cell's energy source. So ATP, we call this a high energy molecule because when we break the bonds that hold ATP together, we release a ton of energy. It is actually the cell's primary energy source. It's its, its preferred energy source. Excuse me. So when we look at the structure of ATP, we have adenine, we've got the sugar ribose, and then we have these three phosphates. So adenosine triphosphate. So when we were so when we go to break apart this phosphate group from the rest of this molecule, we release a ton of energy, um, and that energy can be used to drive other chemical reactions in a cell. If we look at adenosine on its own, it's going to be composed of adenine and ribose. If we look at adenosine monophosphate, we've got adenosine, ribose, and one phosphate group. Then we can have adenosine diphosphate that will have two phosphate groups, and then adenosine triphosphate will have all three phosphate groups. All right, so like I said, we are able to break apart or we're able to release a ton of energy by breaking off one phosphate group and converting adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate. Um, we can also release more energy by breaking off a second phosphate group and converting adenosine diphosphate to adenosine monophosphate. And then here's just a representation of ATP being broken down to ADP and a phosphate and releasing a ton of energy. Of course, if we are going to break apart adenosine triphosphate into smaller components, we're going to use water to do so, hydrolysis. And then if we are forming adenosine triphosphate, energy plus phosphate group and adenosine diphosphate, we're going to form ATP and form water within the process. And here's just another diagram showing you the process of um, making ATP and breaking it down. All right, guys, that is it. I hope that you found this tutorial helpful. Um, let me know if you have any questions about it, and I will hopefully see you in the next video.